A wise man once said, the beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. I choose to not just understand the beer that I drink, but to understand the passion that it takes to create it. This is Geeks on Tap. Hi, welcome to Geeks on Tap. I'm your host, Jarrett, and today we have a very special guest. We have Neto. Uh, I do apologize. Can I have you pronounce your last name? <laughs> Madrigal or Madrigal. Either or Thank works. <laughs> that's, aw- that's awesome because Samantha told me last night, I was like, nah, and she's like, no. And I'm like, nah, and she's like, no. And I'm like, yeah. okay, fine. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But um, yeah, the the mixed name and and the Central Texas attitude, you always get a variety in pronunciations. Right, right. Like Guadalupe and Guadalupe. Yeah. Potato, potato kind of thing. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. All right. How are you been? How are you today? I'm doing good. Doing good. Mm -hmm. Uh, How about yourself? Uh, Did pretty. uh, I went and saw Army of the Dead this morning. So in theaters. Okay, okay. The so, yeah. Dave Batista, right? Right, right. The How new Zack Snyder movie. It was pretty good. Yeah. I I must admit, uh, he does do slow mo, but not as often as he usually does. So <laughs> it's not too bad. Um, but yeah. So you mentioned yeah, to me you're I'm... getting this beer. Oh yeah, you got the uh, yeah. Goober Edson. Uh, that was from Five Stones Brewery, and they're out of yes. New Braunfels. Yeah. Yes, uh, I yes. I have one of their bottles like up on my mantle, so okay, yeah, so pretty good, uh, pretty good brewery. Uh, it's been a while since I've been one of their beers though, so yeah. Okay, yeah, this is actually my first from them. When we were talking about mm-hmm. craft beers, um, mm-hmm. I'm always like, if I'm anywhere, I'm more likely in New Braunfels than Austin here recently. So yeah. I picked something up from there. So yeah, it's definitely not bad. It's an interesting when I saw it was a uh, brewed with peanuts. I thought that was an interesting addition. It is very interesting. I looked at their uh, thing on Untapped. Okay. Uh, on their synopsis of like it's not a it's not a peanut butter stout, guys. <laughs> <laughs> they made they made sure to say that. So, but yeah. That's probably why then, because of the brewed with peanuts really drew their right. attention. Right. Everybody's like, "What's well, a peanut butter stout?" Mm, not really. So. But yeah, um, you know, mentioning my fiance, that's actually how we first met. Um, mm-hmm. la- I think it was right after we started dating. Uh, it was a Halloween party that you and your wife uh, was throwing. And yeah. I came dressed up as Silent Bob. <laughs> and then uh, Samantha came dressed as the, the 11th doctor. And, um, and, and yeah, and we, I met you and I met your wife and... Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I think I brought like a six pack of like craft beer that I would just like I brought to share, but everybody was else drinking, I think stuff that they either brought or they're drinking Shiner. And I was just drinking my craft yeah. beer in the corner, <laughs> <laughs> you know, pretty much. So uh, I wanted to yeah. ask, I mean, I know I've kind of met you on a couple of handful of, uh, a couple of times, but any first impressions of me, you know? <laughs> Uh, that first one, like, honestly, you were, you were quiet, you know, it yeah. was, but that's always the case when you walk into a situation where you're the odd person out, you know, mm-hmm. like, cause it was all, all Samantha's friends. It was all our friends and stuff like that. And you're coming out of the blue. So it, it really puts you uh, at a disadvantage. So, you know, yeah. playing that quiet role is, is not uncommon. I've been there, done that myself, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it was, you know i mean it wasn't like i wasn't open to being friends with you guys it's just it was it was overwhelming i must admit and everybody was like mm-hmm. what are your intentions with her you know what's <laughs> up <laughs> and i was already like hey hey we're just you know we're dating so <laughs> yeah but i mean yeah. like because how many years ago was that now oh god it was like uh... before the trump presidency i would just say that Whew. Without getting that, political, that feels like a decades and decades ago. I know it's but, crazy. You know, like, like if we're being honest, like that is dating in your late twenties, though, right? Like late twenties, early thirties. It's all interrogations once you get to that point mm-hmm. because everybody's known each other so long. Right, um, right. That's pretty fair. I mean, part. you didn't know me from Adam. I mean, it's it's, <laughs> it's pretty fair, you know. So 
Yeah. And I say that though, being that I've, I've been with my wife since high school. So like, I'm usually the interrogator. I've mm-hmm. been in that role long enough of when our friends bring people in, I'm used to being the mm-hmm. one like, oh, I've known this person for a decade plus. Who are you and what are you doing? Yeah. So. <laughs> True. Yeah. That's yeah, fair. So I get that's it. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that's the the thing though. Like it's, you have to make it through those first trials with people, right? I do remember another time that we came over to your house was uh, I think it was the 4th of July after that. And mm-hmm. I brought a couple of my friends over and that's where you, where we found out that you knew Rob Roland, which is a fa- yes. which is a, a co-producer, or a former co-producer of the show, co-creator of the show. And uh, you used to do what, martial arts with him. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We used to beat the hell out of each other. Um, <laughs> um, nice. Yeah, we did a, a mixed martial arts called uh, Kaju Kimbo together at uh, in mm. college. And so we, we met through that. Um, so yeah, we'd known each other for about two years or so. And then mm. graduation and just kind of moving on and running into each other at, you know, at training mm. and class yeah. and stuff like that over there. Um, and then, yeah, I hadn't seen him in like a year plus, And then you come rolling in with him to 4th of July. <laughs> so do you still do martial arts or is that something you haven't really done in a while because of your um, life being so busy? Yeah, that's, that's the sad thing. Um, mm-hmm. probably about, you know, you, you, you get a full-time job and, um, I was teaching and coaching, and that was taking up so much of my time. And I would still make mm-hmm. it to training every now and then, but then having kids and that taking up even more time. And so I just really had to hit the brakes on it, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, I still do a little bit. I still, like when I work out, I do, I incorporate a lot of the exercises, but I'm not into it where I was back in the day, no. Did, did you get to a, le- a belt level? Yes. Um, oh, okay. I made it, I made it to black belt. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 I, I made it to black belt and I was supposed to test for my second degree black belt, mm-hmm. but just because of life and things yeah. trying to make it somewhere for a test and spending all day testing was something I wasn't able to do, unfortunately. Um, because generally with uh, Kaju Kimbo and most martial arts, Mm -hmm. um there's there's years between different degrees of black belts so you have to spend three years training before you can get to the next one um before Mm -hmm. you can test for it and i just wasn't able to dedicate enough time to to get to that point and and put it in but something definitely want to go back to i've never taken any kind of martial arts class so uh, at least you know trying to do that for me would be like i'd probably pull something you know so (laughs) <laughs> uh, i don't know like mm-hmm. for me what it was is i'm such a ninja turtle nerd ah, like ninja uh, turtle we'll, we'll get to power that, rangers yeah. <laughs> yeah ninja turtles power rangers uh dragon ball z um animes mm-hmm. you know all that stuff right and, and that's you know that's one of the branches of nerdism is going into martial arts so. <laughs> yeah now i mean I, i'm i'm a big ninja turtle fan too uh, but you went a step further. You named your son after Leonardo, correct? That was one of the reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we won't say that too loud before my wife yells at me, but that was one of the oh, reasons man. for sure. <laughs> hey, I, I she wanted agreed to, name... to it, so it's too late now. Well, I wanted to name my kid Harrison Lennon, so. <laughs> okay. <You know? laughs> no. And she does but not want I... that, you know, so. <laughs> I, I think you could get away with one I, and that's kind of the compromise we came to is yeah. is we we incorporated one of the nerdy names with a more traditional yeah. name right and so but the thing is is like there there's a big joke going around the internet now as anime has grown in popularity right you're gonna mm-hmm. have somebody named goku smith um like in a in a class <laughs> so like right. I can get away with with a Leonardo if yeah. if he goes to school with Goku or Sasuke or you know one of those. Um, yeah, I mean, I I was a big Ninja Turtles fan since I was a kid. I had all the 
I wouldn't say all of the figures, but I definitely watched the show. I went, you know, had the movies and, you know, had the, I think I even had the party van as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. The party so, van. And, uh-huh. you know, like the little like uh, containers that they would have, you could put all your, yeah. your figures in. <laughs> I never had the container. Um, my dad yeah. actually built um, a sewer headquarters out of cardboard. Oh, wow. Spray paint and newspaper clipping. Yeah, yeah. My dad was inventive that way. And so we he cut it up and he, it was back when Target did the big toy ads in their, like, mm-hmm. in the inserts in the newspapers. And right. so we sat down and we cut it all out and he cut holes and made sewer entrances and took tubing and wow. made it a sewer. <laughs> yeah, great. like he he hooked it up, but like for me, like I was on that uh that cuss of where Ninja Turtles were like the big thing, my first real big thing. Mm-hmm. You know, so for him it was the first thing I really got into. It's one of the first things I remember, honestly. My first movie I ever remember seeing is the first Ninja Turtle movie in theaters. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's it's a real big part for me. So for him, yeah. enjoying that was a big deal. Like, I still have around my room, I have uh, the 2000 action figures hanging on the wall. Um, mm. I guess 2001. Was it 2001? I think so. Mm-hmm. Um, the mm. The... It was the first big cartoon after the yeah. that late 80s, early 91s. Right, and then right. I also have the, I think it's 2009, the, the figures, the first set of figures that came out with Nickelodeon. Oh, I think it was like 2012. But yeah, roughly around that time. Yeah, yeah. I, so I got yeah. the, the first mm-hmm. round of those figures that came out were, while they had the more um, animated stylized CG look, they were still the traditional mm-hmm. kind of just the turtle with the weapons. And so right. I bought all those and I have those hanging around up here too. <laughs> nice. That's right. I, I don't have any of my figures. I I lost them to time. I wish I had like a whole couple of them like in, in still in containers or or even in the packaging. Yeah, I don't. But, yeah. Yeah, I don't have my originals. I'll unfortunately yeah. that's I lost those because you know you're a kid. You popped them open, you played with them. We didn't know about cherry back then and all that stuff. If I was smart, I would have had my parents buy two of them and then <laughs> Same, open up but, one because they have the other one, but you know. And that's probably what I'll do when kids. I buy toys for my kids that are along those lines. Mm-hmm. You don't know it yet, but here you go. That that was a big thing for me. Uh, I, I also heard that you're a big Beatles fan too, correct? I was. I went through a stage. Like so, personally, um, I'm not a music guy. I don't have that talent. I don't have that ear. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I grew up on oldies because of my parents, and you know, listened to a lot of Beatles, a lot of stuff from the '60s and '50s mm-hmm. and '70s. Right. Um, and so I was a big Beatles fan just because of them. And then, of course, and we, we've talked about this, when Rock Band came out, I, I yeah, got the yeah. Beatles edition. <laughs> um, and that made me a bigger Beatles fan. Right. Uh, because you could really dive into the history, and they had some good mm-hmm. stuff. And honestly, that game, historically, for like the Beatles, had a lot of good stuff in it. Oh, yeah, definitely. That, um, yeah. I remember, I think I bought the, I know I bought the, uh, the Abbey Road DLC for that. And then I bought, I want to say it was Rubber Soul DLC as well. Okay. So the entire album, like yeah. you could play the entire album. And um, did you have like the drum set or did you, what did you I have? Bought the, yeah, no, I bought the the big box set, the, the legacy oh. set where it came with the drums. Um, and then it came with two guitars. Well, it came with the guitar oh. and the bass. Yeah. Yeah, so I still have that actually. I keep that in storage uh-huh. right now, fully boxed. I use wow. them a lot, so they do have wear and tear. Yeah, but I still have the original box and everything, so that way, I mean, uh-huh. it's still good to go. <laughs> I had um, did, so the guitar that you had is that the George's or is that John's? I bought them all. <laughs> oh, you had all of them. Okay, because I had yeah, I had John's. yeah, because it. It came with John's. No, it came with yeah. George's because they made you buy yeah. John's. Uh, uh-huh. I, I just know I went out and I'm pretty sure it came with George's because they had John's separate because, you know, it, it's mm-hmm. linen. 
Um, right. And so I, I I went and bought all the pieces. So that way I had the full set. Yeah, I yeah. had the uh, the Lennon one. I had the Rickenbacker, which mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that was a great, <laughs> that was a great, I, the, the detail yeah, well, on those guitars such... are amazing. And that's what killed it. They they were perfect mm. for the iconic look. It had the bass cover. It had the drum set. Mm-hmm. Even with the around the drum, the rings and everything had the right coloring and everything. Wow. So it wow. was it was such on, so on point with the detail. It mm-hmm. was gorgeous. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, God, I love playing that game. I wish I still had it. That's the only reason I wish I still had a console. What would to play that was would be to play that game again, but. I don't really play a lot of video games. I, I try not to. So I've got too much stuff to do. <laughs> I, I'm I'm right there with you. Um, yeah. At the beginning of, of COVID and quarantine, I got back into mm. video games a little bit. Yeah. Uh, because they were, PlayStation was giving out so many free ones. Mm. Uh, That's good. So I, I took, I downloaded some of the free ones and played some of those. And I tried to get back into some of my back catalog but mm-hmm. I, I don't think I finished a single game over COVID. I started like three, played like maybe a dozen hours and then was like, okay, real mm-hmm. life back, like have to do stuff. Yeah. Oh my gosh, just lost my train of thought. I'm sorry about that. But anyways, <laughs> no, you're good, man. Um, okay. The stout sit we'll harder jump. than the rest sometimes. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like this beer is making me forget. It's a, it's a um, cherry, black cherry stout actually oh that sounds good it's called a uh, grown-ass man it's from san gabriel I totally butchered that i'm sorry <laughs> san gabriel <laughs> uh river brewery uh don't know exactly where oh liberty hill texas so oh okay how, how yeah. sweet is it though it's dry it's like actually dry it's not it's not very sweet i'm actually okay. surprised that, to me, that's a good thing, though. I feel anytime mm. they add a cherry to the name, you either yeah. get an overly sweet one, right? Or like that's what it is most of the time. I'm not a big fan of that, so I may have to give that a shot if it's not overly sweet. Dry sounds uh, good to me. Yeah, I feel like it. I mean, if you're a fan of dry stouts, I would definitely recommend it. That's something that I'm not totally into. I'm not a big fan of dry stouts. I like a little bit of wetness to it or some flavor, yeah. a little bit of the sweetness to it to make it a little bit more intriguing for me. But, you know, um, you know, I found this. I just like, oh, let me try it. So, well, uh, the main reason I brought you on the show was because um, you are a dungeon master. And, you know, D&D yes, is a very... The nerdy kind. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> this is that, that's a very geeky thing that I wanted to talk about because as somebody oh, who man. doesn't really dive into D&D, uh, I played it like... I, I think maybe twice, if even that. And I, I think I just, I'm going to, I'm going to make myself kind of like, seem like kind of a snob, but I've always been kind of like, well, that's that kind of geek, you know, <laughs> kind of like, I'm this kind of geek. I'm not that kind of geek. So um, I would like to kind of go over it a little bit with you because somebody yeah. who doesn't know anything about it. Um, you know, I've seen it on Stranger Things like everybody else, but yeah. <laughs> so but uh, the second most popular reason bit? people start playing exactly what, what's the number one is it um it is a live play uh twitch stream called critical role mm. um it is I've heard of it. it's yeah yeah see that's the thing mm. you've heard of it and you don't even play right it, it's so popular they're going to have an animated series on netflix they have a comic book series really um they have their own game production they have their own printing studio like that that's the number one reason most people like if we're being honest like Mm -hmm. that's most new people are probably accredited to critical role on joining the game yeah i'm sure of it i mean that's that's something like like you said it's something i don't even play and i know of you know yeah yeah so but it's what happens when all your favorite voice actors do video uh all your favorite video game and anime voice mm-hmm. actors play a game together. From what I understand, there's different campaigns and different ways to play. Is that correct? Um, there's different campaigns, and uh-huh. it, it generally we call those they're called modules, right? Um, they mm-hmm. create a book, and it has a a campaign in it or a module, and it covers mm-hmm. a story. Like uh, the one I'm running tonight is actually called "Descent into Avernus." 
and you mm. head into hell. Yeah. A city has been sucked into the first level of hell, and okay. your party's job is to figure out how, why, and to free the city. That um, sounds very, uh, very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then there's other ones where you head into the jungle to figure out what this terrible curse is that's afflicting mm. the world. Um, and there's another one where a cult's trying to summon the god of dragons or goddess of dragons, to be specific. Um, and you have to stop that. Uh, there's another one where there's a curse in the north. I mean, there's a whole bunch. And then there's homebrew where people make their own. So those are the kind of mm -hmm. two types of campaigns right. you have pre-made and then homebrew where people make their own. But yeah, I mean, and that, okay. those worlds are so in depth and stuff like that. You can mm -hmm. get into a lot of things. How long have you been a dungeon master? Uh, okay. So I started playing D and D in 2001 mm, okay. with the, with the release of third edition Dungeons and Dragons. We're now on fifth edition. Okay. Um, so I started playing in junior high, middle school with friends, and then I've been playing ever since. And two years ago, I started professionally being a DM and Dungeon Master, uh, mm -hmm. doing it on a professional level where I ran it for people and then made money and eventually mm -hmm. made a profit. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, but it's I've been crazy. doing it, yeah. It's just crazy because like people like go like ah you know people in their basements playing that game they're never gonna do anything with it you know back in the seventies and eighties it was the satanic satanic panic all that stuff and yeah and now it's like we're making money off it you know <laughs> oh it's it's a multi million dollar company I mean yeah. and that's not including like we said Critical Role which has created their own company which is not mm -hmm. the creators of DD. they don't make DD content they just play DD, and now mm -hmm. they're just adding stuff to it and they're making money that way right like yeah their characters are so popular that they make money mm -hmm. for just playing a character in a game that somebody else made oh wow <laughs> and, yeah so and all i do <laughs> <laughs> is i read from a book and help people play their characters like that's yeah that's you know there's more to it of course you know there's right, voice right. acting and there's skill and knowing the rules and being friendly but like yeah i read from a book and like it's it's almost like reading to you you know reading elementary school you know mm -hmm. reading rainbow style i'm like and so you do this now roll a <laughs> dice for me you succeeded good job <laughs> well i mean you have to you have to know how to tell a story you know if yeah. you're a dungeon master you'd have to know like mm -hmm. you said know the rules and know what you're gonna do mm -hmm. and and kind of almost predict what that would and i'm sure that you're going off a manual you know kind of like doing like okay if you if you take this role you know if you do this action this is the consequence of that action so yeah yeah it just seems like you're you are like the director basically of this yeah, campaign yeah, yeah. so yeah yeah and, and i uh i always laugh because i think uh personally the two types of people that make the best dungeon masters the best dms mm -hmm. are either a teachers which i am mm, okay. or b yeah. directors Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> because you're so used to setting up a scenario and controlling that and you there, there's a lot of controversy online if you get into like big D, &D politics because yes there are D, &D politics okay <laughs> <laughs> well it's like anything in the nerd community right dc versus yeah. marvel you know okay. or yeah yeah or like is you know how's harry potter going and how does jk rowling treat that in D, &D some people don't like an over controlling director Mm -hmm. They want somebody who's really just setting pieces up and then they play mm -hmm. with the stage set. They just control everything and play. Other people want a, a DM, a dungeon master, who's going to be like, okay, so here's the stage, here's the scene, now what do you do? Mm -hmm. um, others just want, here's the stage. And and so that all contributes to how you play D&D. &D. And the thing is, though, is that some people feel D&D &D is too controlling 
And it's much more, mm -hmm. here's the stage, I'm going to direct you and tell you where to go, and you just work within that wall. Then there's mm -hmm. other games which are much broader, other tabletop RPGs that are to the point that you can be whatever you want. I'm just going to tell you if you succeed or fail based on the rules. I'm right. not going to control anything else. And, and that's yeah. the thing that the, the game is so broad. Um, there's actually like a whole group out there that feels D&D &D is ruining tabletop games or tabletop RPG games mm, because okay. it's only showing one side of the coin, right? It, it's the same issue. Like, let's look at craft beers, right? Some people okay. get so mad at craft beers because they're like, oh, those are a very select group of beer drinkers. Go drink mm -hmm. a Natty Light yeah. and you'll be okay. Right. And so it's the same. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm not gonna lie. There are snobs in our, in our circles too. So yeah. And, yeah. And it's with anything that people take very passionately. They love very, exactly. very much, you know, passion, you either love it or you hate it. And there's no in between when it comes to passion. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. And so like mm -hmm. th there's all that. And so as, as the DM, it's finding which group and which players fall into each category and just kind of making it mm -hmm. fit for each of them and telling a story that they want to be part of and telling a story that they are to a degree in control of i'm big into we're telling a story together in dungeons and dragons mm -hmm. you're the main characters i'm just mm -hmm. the the shadowy hand that's allowing you all to to keep going and everything whenever you're doing that uh, how long do campaigns usually take? I, I know friends that probably, I know that's a bloated question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I have friends that have played games and they're like, yeah, we're, you know, day 15 on this campaign or something like that. Or they're like, they continue like week after week, you know, so. Yeah, so it it's really depends, right? So right yeah. now I run about five games a week. Each game is okay. four hours. Um, well, I'm going to say okay. three to five hours a game. Okay, okay. Three to five, okay. Yeah. Some of these games are ongoing stories that we've been playing since back in October. We play every oh, wow. week for three to five hours, and it's the same story. Other games are literally three to five hours, and it's just, uh -huh. that's it. It's never the same group again never the same uh, players again we told one story we moved on okay uh, so it depends what you really want from the game right you can mm -hmm. go three four weeks and tell a story and have you know 20 30 hours worth of gameplay and then you're done mm -hmm. or you can go like um before covid hit i had a, a homebrew game so it's a world i made a story mm -hmm. i designed uh, okay and we played for two years almost every week <laughs> two years wow for, <laughs> for four hours right i mean wow. so let's knock out let's say it's a that's 400 hours in one story mm -hmm. roughly um and they're only about halfway through that story mm -hmm. uh and so games can run like that and that's they're meant to be and then others you can knock out in like 120 hours just like a video game you yeah. know, it, it's the same. It's how much time and story and stuff you want to put into it. But I mean, if you really dive, there's a whole market for people who uh, do OC art for your character. I mean, so if you go online to, to Twitter or to Instagram mm -hmm. or any of these websites, okay. you'll find people who will draw your original character from your D&D campaign. The, okay. They will charge anywhere, I, I've, in my opinion they're worth anywhere from 50 to $200 to draw this picture of your character. And people pay wow. that on the regular. Yeah. And <laughs> so that's the thing though, right? So think about it. Yeah. Though. You played this character every day or every week for mm -hmm. a year plus. Yeah. Four hours a week. I mean, people are putting down money and you can make a living just drawing yeah. people's original characters in D and D and I've seen it. Um, Wow. So the, there, there's an investment there. There, there's a desire and a tie to these characters. Same thing with any, like we were saying earlier, any fandom. You just get mm -hmm. invested, and there's a passion to it. Right. I think it's just it's. I mean, 
coming from some, I mean, for me, like I, it's really, I don't know, like getting paid to play video games or, you know, getting paid to do D and D, it just kind of boggles my mind. It's People like, do though. I know, I know they do. I'm not saying they don't. I'm just saying it just kind of like, it blows my mind because I think like, uh, you know, a friend of mine was saying like, yeah, people on TikTok, they're making money off doing dances. I'm like, how is that possible? Like, what is going on? <laughs> so because of COVID. I'm too old. I'm too old. I'm too old. <laughs> no, we're, uh, we're together. So because of COVID and just because of my career field and teaching and mm. stuff like that, here within the last month, I actually started getting into TikTok. And I'm just like, okay. okay, there's, there's DMs on there. I can do some advertising. Yeah. I can do yeah. some, get to know some people, get some new customers, stuff like that. If I create content, yeah. but I'm flipping through it. There's people who literally have tens of thousands of followers mm -hmm. and all they yeah. do is lip sync to comedians. <laughs> yes. I see the look on your face. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah, they <laughs> lip sync to stand-up routines. Think of your favorite stand-up routine, uh, and then just lip sync, and you can have tens of thousand people following you. And so it's such a bizarre thing. But I think you know yeah. the, this is the history teacher of me, the 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 social studies teacher coming out right now. Uh huh. Okay. But that's kind of that's kind of where our society has gone in forms of entertainment at this point mm -hmm. it's it's such a self-propelling concept now wow. we control our own entertainment before you know you you had storytellers around the fire thousands of mm -hmm. years ago right and then in the last hundred years we had like you know a handful of channels yeah and then we got cable right but now we're to the point that anybody can entertain anybody so whatever you think is funny you can find mm -hmm. and and people will pay you when twitch came out it made absolutely no sense to me because mm -hmm. it was big for yeah. video game streamers right and i sat here day after day thinking why do you want to watch somebody else play a video game that you own yeah true and it makes no sense to me <laughs> Because I'm like, just play the game. Just sit <laughs> and but as things have grown and like as I see these things, there's so much more to it, right? It starts yeah. becoming a conversation. They start becoming a friend and they start becoming a personality. And and that's one thing. Like I'd I'd streamed a little bit with um with D and D just for a minute, because I have terrible country internet, as you've already noticed. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know. <laughs> and, and my players liked it, but the big appeal to them, it's not to be the next big streamer is because people come and interact okay. and people get involved and they're, and they're helping you tell these stories and you get that connection. And mm -hmm. that's kind of why online D and D has blown up so big over mm -hmm. the last year. So for a lot of people, COVID really pushed them yeah. to understand that, okay, my local scene may be crap, but I yeah. can go online and pick mm -hmm. from hundreds of thousands of people that I didn't have the option to play with before now to create a game with and tell a story with. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's a lot of appeal with that. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, think about it on the bar scene. Like, mm. if you didn't have to buy your own beer, and someone could like deliver it and teleport it to you, how much more enjoyable mm. would the bar scene be if you could sit on your couch and mingle with people from across the nation who kind of like the same beer? Well, and that's the thing, like Twitch has become much more than just gaming now. Like it's mm -hmm. like this, you know, there's, there's yeah. some shows that are doing this, or there's some shows that are just like, tutorials or i i i had a guest on who does workout videos on twitch mm -hmm. so yeah. you know it's it's a bunch of different things now it's not just gaming anymore it's kind of branched out a lot a lot a lot different oh yeah for sure yeah it's so much more now i've seen mm -hmm. now i'm i'm not actually like besides the minor bit of streaming i've done i don't follow anybody on twitch but i know mm -hmm. a lot of people that do 
And like, right. you can follow, like you said, people who do workout videos, you mm-hmm. can literally sit down and, you know, they're playing a video game. There's people who do, like you said, tutorials. Um, there's people that I follow in other medias, but I know they do Twitches where they like, they do miniature painting for D and D they paint the models mm-hmm. and the figurines and stuff like that. Oh, and wow, they'll do okay. the live paints and stuff like that. Okay. That's cool. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of cool things and varieties that people have on there. So it is such a Mm -hmm. huge thing that it, but it's still, it's hard to understand to a degree, but less hard (laughs) to understand. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that whole thing about, it's just, it's just the, the, the way that people can make money now, it's just really amazing. Kind of, (laughs) kind of freaks me out. Well, that's the thing though. And that's kind of what I learned about D and D. Um, so mm-hmm. like not to get like too crazy into it, like because of COVID and because of health issues, I had to take a leave of absence from work. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so there were months where I wasn't getting paid at all. Right, so I needed right. to find something to do. And that's how I got into the professional D&D thing um, mm-hmm. online. Like when I started, I actually started playing D&D in bars. Um, and so mm-hmm. what I saw it as is an opportunity to meet new people. And because I was running everything, I was like, okay, Mm -hmm. I had a tip jar. And I was like, okay, Mm -hmm. if you enjoy the game, if you want to play, throw some money in the jar. Um, And that's how I was doing it. That's two years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And it's because I saw an opportunity and I was like, okay, I can make a little money out of this, but I only saw it as a little bit of money. Then when I was on my leave of absence and I wasn't getting paid, I was like, I have to pay the bills. How do I make money? Um, And so I was looking at all these online jobs. I was looking at all these things. And then I saw literally it was a website that was like, hey, we run games for Dungeons and Dragons. Do you (laughs) want to sign up for a game? I was like, I don't want to sign up for a game because I don't have the time. But they're like, do you run games? And I was like, yes, yes, I Mm, do run games. Okay, yeah. Um, So I signed up for the website and I started running games and by i mean before december i was already getting packed i had so many people Mm -hmm. looking for games i was getting paid so from october november so within three months i was a professional dm making good money um Mm -hmm. and i was like and very much like you said like how do you do this like Mm -hmm. literally i just did it and all of a sudden i went from like oh tips making like 10 20 dollars mm-hmm. a night to making 10 20 dollars a person mm-hmm. um and there's five to six people in a game right wow so it, it <laughs> changed so drastically because you just kind of had to hop in and do it it was I was in shell shock, honestly, like Mm -hmm. I would get done with a session and I would see how much I was getting paid. And I'd go tell my wife, I'm like, why are people paying me to do this? I don't understand. (laughs) You're crazy. Why are you doing this? (laughs) <laughs> yeah like i you, you don't want to tell your customer yeah, that know, you're right? crazy don't pay me but it, <laughs> but don't i was like if you don't pay? <laughs> yeah but at the same time i was like i have rent to pay so i'm gonna charge you <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so it was such a bizarre experience and i actually there there's a big group of dms out there that when we first started and stuff mm-hmm. because now i'm actually number four on the website i'm the fourth oh wow like most popular or most reviewed dm um, wow that's great yeah I, I yeah it's it's a lot of work and i love it though so uh, uh, but it, we had a group when the the website was first kicking off and covid was first going on they're like why are they doing this like none of us in the dm community <laughs> understood and so there was a lot of talk about imposter syndrome and like okay, mm. we're nerdy and we really love this game, but damn, <laughs> there's still a big argument online if DMs should or should not get paid. Mm, okay. And it's because if you think about the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s, yeah. it wasn't a thing you got paid for. You hung out with friends, you played mm-hmm. D&D, you had a good time, 
and you paid with pizza or beers or, you know, yeah. like how you pay your buddies. And right. now people are making, and, and on the website, this is just coming from the website. Um, there's people that can make up to $50 an hour running what? D&D games. Oh my yes. God. That's, that's, I mean, that's great, but that's, that's just insane. A- <laughs> that's just on this website there the the Gosh. youtubers the streamers they're making a yeah. hundred plus an hour to play these games <sighs> wow there's uh and it's one there's one thing i actually want to do but it's it's called D in a castle it's ran wow. by a, a company that they get the top streamers the top youtubers mm-hmm. you fly to england you spend about three four days there and you play D and D every day with these top streamers. Wow! It's like seven thousand dollars. Oh yeah, <laughs> the flight and all that stuff. Yeah. No, no, no. That's not including the flight. You have to fly oh, yourself there. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, oh, oh, oh. So that's seven thousand just to get into it, and not. It's 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 basically a three day B and B with food and alcohol. Like think of it like oh, a cruise, wow. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But but it's to play D and D. Yeah, it, it's it's just there's the market there, and and I say D and D, and we could get into so many others, right? There's like Call of Cthulhu, um, yeah. Which which there there's a D and I call it D and D, but it's not right. But it's the same. It's a tabletop yeah. RPG. Yeah. Um. There there's so many other games out there that you can play with the same concepts of sitting down at a table and role playing. Mm-hmm. Um. There but people will pay for it. I've, I've, I actually host a variety of games. D and D is my bread and butter, but mm. there's games like it, which are called clones or copies that are very similar, just a little different. Then there's some that are very drastically different that are still an RPG and role-playing game, but mm. you know, the rules are completely out there and I run a good variety, but I mean, people pay for it because they want to play. They don't want to run it. And, and that's the service. And that's where we kind of had to get into. It's, it's like a restaurant, right? You can cook at yeah. home. Right. But Good do you want to clean up? Do you want to cook? And when somebody in our like imposter syndrome DM group made that comparison, I was just like, click. Okay. Yeah. You're mm-hmm. right. We go to restaurants. We pay for our food. That's, that's fair. Then it's fair for me to get paid. Yeah. Yeah. Again, long story all the way back around. <laughs> right. I mean, and to be fair, it's kind of like almost like a gig mentality, like a gig work mentality where, you know, I mean, one of the things that I've always come had to come to terms with, with what I do or, you know, me taking, you know, I have a degree in film. So that whole idea was like, you know, you get paid for what your time, get paid for your, you know, know your worth, know your pay worth and know that, you know, people are paying you for your time and your your skills. So you have to understand that that's something that you have to fight for, you know, and not be like, well, I'm not, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm just doing this for fun or blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, you're, you're taking time out of your day. You're taking time out of your family's time, you know, to be able to do this. So you deserve to get paid for it. So, you know, just trying to come to that terms of, of what that is in your mind, you know, it's, understandable yeah and and i mean the what's funny about that though is that this is Mm -hmm. a big argument like if we're going to keep it really nerdy right like comic con artist alley right yeah Mm -hmm. you know like think about how much time and effort goes into prepping those prints and getting everything i mean there's still a big argument you would think after like you know we're looking at what a hundred years of like mainstream comics, action comics, uh, detective 80, comics. Yeah, eighty roughly. Yeah, like I mean, yeah. we're looking at the twenties, thirties, kind of rolling out mm-hmm. uh, with our early, early comics, and I mean, there's yeah. still arguments on the artists. Do they deserve to get like? Well, we all know they deserve to, but there's people who still argue that, hey, cut me a discount for this one of a kind, unique picture that you're going to draw me at this Comic Con. Um, and, and those arguments. And it's just D&D and tabletop games and video gamers are now stepping onto that platform of, like you said, mm-hmm. knowing your worth. Yeah. And, and it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, um, one of the things that 
you know, kind of going back to the whole, you know, artist alley thing is that, you know, for years, you know, I think, I think it was especially with Marvel where their artists were because they were hired by Marvel that they did not get credit or they did not get the proper royalties of the characters that they created, not knowing about like generations later that they would be like movie properties, you know? Yes. <laughs> and stuff like that. Well, like, I mean, both Superman and Captain America just mm-hmm. ended lawsuits, what, within the last 20 years over yeah. who gets credit for creation and stuff like that? Yeah, and and, and the co-creator of Batman, not, not Bob Kane, but the other guy, Bill Finger, just now got credit yes. because he came up with the look of Batman, not the mm-hmm. character. So, yeah, it's just – it's crazy because Bob Kane forever – I mean, like, Bob Kane, no disrespect to Bob Kane – but he or, did take credit yeah, he's Bob Kane. for a long time. <laughs> yeah. About everything. Well, and I mean, Batman. like, yeah. 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 And, and, and that's the thing. And I think it's um, an interesting concepts that we're now starting to deal with, with mm-hmm. like what qualifies as, as a service provided and what is intellectual property and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And I think nerds are generally going to be at the forefront. <laughs> like, you you can push it all the way to like Tesla and Edison, right? Like, yeah, Edison was the the big corporate brain, but Tesla was the nerd who was providing a lot of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And Edison had a whole lot of other nerds working under him that he took credit for their assignment. I have no more beer left. Okay, I'll game. I just opened another one, so okay, we're gonna oh, open up. Which one? Another another one? Uh, just same? another goober. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, How is you that? can't go wrong with the name. I like it. I get why yeah. people were setting it up, like trying to see if it was a peanut butter stout. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, because you do have that peanut note at the end. It, it's not as mm-hmm. rich as a general peanut butter. Um, yeah. But you do get the peanut snap, uh, aftertaste, a little bit of that flavor. So I get the argument. It's not bad though. It's not too heavy. Um, some stouts, mm-hmm. you know how they can be really thick and really kind of heavy on you. This one's mm-hmm. a little bit lighter than your standard stout. So I'm enjoying it. I would definitely wouldn't mind getting it again. That's good. I I I want to try that now. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. knowing that you that kind of what you talked about because I do I do like peanut butter stouts. I mean I know they say whatever, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. I do like you know yeah. nut, you know flavors of nut of 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 nuts inside the um, you know the beer so mm-hmm. um, yeah they um, one of my favorite breweries of all time is Lakewood Brewery they're out of Dallas and they do the Temptress line so okay. they have like their Temptress and they have their peanut butter Temptress they've got their uh, salted caramel Temptress. And they Ooh. have a French toast temptress. Okay, I haven't had those. I'll have to look into it. Yeah, they have a mole temptress as well. Mm. Really? Okay. Right. I love mole. I had, don't get me wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I I love mole. Like I'm, you know, Central mm-hmm. Texas, South Texas. Yeah. Like I have a little last name that I have. I love mole. Right. But. I don't know as a as a beer how well that translates. Maybe if it's I actually, have some tacos to go with it. It's actually quite smooth. Like I, I had it once at the Texas Craft Beer Festival a couple mm-hmm. years back, and I had like the last one of the keg that they had, and it was spot on. It was amazing. Okay. It was beautiful. Okay. And um, they just came out with s'mores temptress. So I'm very tempted. I'm very tempted to see what that is because I've had the Shiner s'mores beer, which I did enjoy. I didn't even know Shiner had one. Yeah, I do. <laughs> They've been trying to dive into a little bit more crafty craftiness in the last couple of years. So because they had a candy pecan uh, beer recently as well. Okay. Hmm. So that was pretty good. I like that one too. Like uh, they they they're trying, you know, they're trying to stay relevant in the craft beer scene, which I really do appreciate. So well, because they're such a borderline company, they mm-hmm. like 
they, they try to keep that homey feel and stuff like that, but they've yeah. grown so much over the last like 20, 30 years. It's just, mm -hmm. it's hard. Are you mm -hmm. more of a DC fan or a Marvel fan? Hold on. There's a Matt Fraction, Bucky Barnes, Captain America right there. Okay, fair enough. Um, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> no, I'm, I like yeah. DC. Don't get me yeah. wrong. DC has some really good stuff in it. Um, yeah. But I feel Marvel, for the most part, is tends to be a little more relatable because mm -hmm. they keep their characters. What What's the saying? That Marvel is people who have the powers of gods. Right. And then DC is gods who are people. Um, right. And so I've always been a bigger fan of, of Marvel, uh, especially considering when I, so I'd always liked comics, but when I finally had money to buy comics, mm -hmm. um, that was coming in house of M civil war, mm -hmm. yeah. some really big storylines were going on for Marvel. So Marvel grabbed a little bit more of my attention at the time. And when I was really, going through college when I was buying comics on a weekly basis and getting my weeklies mm -hmm. and all that, it was Marvel uh, rolling through, like I said, civil war or house of M well house of M civil war, and then going on up through some of the big arcs with fear itself and secret mm -hmm. invasion and, and all right. that stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're doing secret invasion for like the Disney plus. So I'm, yeah, I'm curious about yeah. how that's going to go. Uh, because yeah. I'm liking the shows right now. Mm -hmm. I felt right. WandaVision, I think, was really good. Yeah, yeah. I, I, really I think it. it was me and the wife were talking about how it showed such a how to deal with grief mm -hmm. and how right. post in game and all of that stuff, how you cope with loss. Mm -hmm. And then we felt that winter soldier and Falcon was how to move forward with loss, how to move forward with change and all of that. Right. stuff. So those are really good. I don't, I like what Disney plus is doing with in how to tie together television and mm -hmm. cinema, which yeah. I hurt my heart because I loved agents of shield. Did you ever watch that? I watched, I think, like the first season, but I never really moved past it because, I mean, I you know, I just kind of like kind of dropped out of it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I, I liked Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. It wasn't perfect, but it was solid. And I was hoping to have that bridge with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and it never mm -hmm. occurred. And now Disney Plus is doing that. Right. And I think it's showing a good it's showing a really good job of what you can do by allowing mm -hmm. a a show quote unquote show to continue a story that you couldn't do in two and a half hours or two hours. Right. But yeah, it just seemed like the the TV and the movie stuff was so separate. Uh especially when you have like the inhuman situation. And then mm -hmm. um also with um like they were supposed to tie in all these things and they never did and just a totally yeah. separate you know separate company. And um yeah I mean we watched Inhumans Ooh, how was that because i did not jump on that train uh i mean it wasn't <laughs> as bad as everybody says it is but it's not great like and, and the fact that that was supposed to be a movie like that just shows how bad like they did it on tv so because it could have been 10 times better as a film because of the special effects and everything so it's just <sighs> Like they get rid of Medusa's hair, like within like the second episode. Oh, like first episode, that... first episode. <laughs> wow, because that's yeah. such a like big part of. Mm -hmm. And see, and yeah. I guess I'm that makes me more glad that I didn't dive down that road because yeah. I think the Inhumans they they have solid characters. There's some great stuff. Black Bolt is just an amazing character. I mean, when your voice mm -hmm. can do what his does, like it's rad. Uh, so it just, yeah. <laughs> it's a shame. Well, it's its just funny because like this, this seems like they were saving it for season two because they had him like speak twice and that was it. You know, that was kind of. Well, did he wipe out mountains when he spoke? Like, 
Not really. He just he just impacted a, a bunker. <laughs> he flipped over two <laughs> cop cars. <laughs> ah, that's weak. No, one of the shows that actually was really good, and I think it's the best version or best as example of ABC doing their thing is um, is Agent Carter because that was a great tie-in to what they did. I'm really sad they only did two seasons because they could have done much more. I agree, uh, especially yeah. considering they brought her in with Endgame and and mm-hmm. they tied that kind of right. Steve story arc and kind of wrapped it up. Because yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. I liked Agent Carter. I yeah. enjoyed that story. Um, there was a lot that could have been told, but I think the issue mm-hmm. with that, and this is maybe my personal opinion, more yeah. comic book lore, is that you start messing with big storylines, you start getting loopholes. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, that's and the I thing think, is like uh, the- Agent Carter was going to do that. Well, that's the thing at the end, you're like, oh, I'm glad she's Basuza. And it's like, but what about Steve? <laughs> exactly. You know, so like then and right. then you watch Endgame, you're like, but what about Sousa? <laughs> he had, he actually had a really good arc and he yeah. really broke the the stereotypes of the the 40s and 50s. And you know, um yeah, I agree with you. Like, have you seen this stuff where they're setting up all the young Avengers across Marvel? Uh, I mean, there's talk. It's not official yet, but yeah, definitely with Isaiah Bradley's. Uh, yeah, with Isaiah Bradley's nephew or godson or grandson, right? So it's his grandson. It's Eli. Grandson. Yeah. He's supposed to be Patriot, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And then so you've got, what I mean, they set it up with yeah. Wanda already, where you had uh, Wiccan and you had yeah. Speed, the boys. Yeah, and the, those are popping up, and I think they're missing. Last I read, to to double check. Well, I mean, you already had it setting up with Cassie and Ant Man, because mm-hmm. Cassie is a, a young Avenger there, and Young Avengers is a great comic that I was reading back mm-hmm. when I was buying weeklies and stuff like that, right. which didn't ever truly get wrapped up in my opinion. Um, but it was a good story and yeah they're setting them all up there there's talks about if they're going to make a movie or they're going to do a show or who they're going to tweak because there's only two mm-hmm. missing which is iron lad and hulkling um mm-hmm. and well, so they're kind of talking isn't about k bishop k bishop is one of them too right she's already announced though she's yeah, gonna I be know. the hawkeye yeah. show right yeah. exactly yeah 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 the only two that aren't official in any way i guess is what i meant um who aren't being who aren't already on a a list somewhere mm-hmm. are hopeling mm-hmm. and uh iron lad well they're doing iron heart so i don't know if they're swapping out iron lad for iron heart to be honest and that's one of the rumors are they just gonna yeah. do a flip there real quick mm-hmm. with uh what's her name riri yeah um uh see that, I, that's kind of one of the ones yeah. that i've i've slipped out of since yeah. you know moving on and getting older and budgeting mm-hmm. can't buy comics as much but right uh right. yeah she she replacing iron heart and becoming the new kind of iron lad slash iron man in that story right yeah that's the thing like i'm really looking forward to uh loki i think loki's gonna be a trip <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I, I know. Because it, it feels like they've played it safe. Like, honestly, like mm-hmm. it's weird saying they played it safe with WandaVision because that was a yeah. trip. <laughs> but compared to what they're going to do with Loki, it feels like WandaVision and uh, Falcon Winter Soldier were safe compared to where mm-hmm. we're going next month. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm really... Um, I'm really glad that Sam is the new Warner of uh, uh, Warner Soldier, <laughs> Captain America. Because I mean, even Bucky was like, "Yeah, dude, it's your sh- you, it's your shield. Like, you need to have it." So, oh, since you're a Bucky fan, what what are your thoughts on that? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, Captain uh, Falcon Winter Soldier was amazing. It was a great yeah. show. Don't get me wrong; mm-hmm. I won't discredit yeah. that show at all. Right. Um, I think they covered a lot of things, but for me, who who read Civil War, 
mm-hmm. who read through the Death of Cap, who had, you know, the first edition, first cover Death of Cap weekly comic. Mm-hmm. Um, it was there when all that was going on. I liked when when Bucky picked it up and he became Captain America for a while. And I mm-hmm. enjoyed that story arc. Um, and, you know, I enjoyed, you know, Sam picking up the shield when that when he became yeah. Captain America in the comics and stuff, too. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not discrediting that. Yeah, and I think for the for the Marvel Universe and for the world we live in now, skipping that was the right call. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and doing and going into that, it had a bigger impact in our world today than, you know, 10 years ago when they were doing everything. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it's still I'm a huge fan of, of Matt Fraction's writing. I'm a huge fan of his stories. So for me, mm-hmm. it, we missed out on some story arc there that could have been a lot of fun by a mm-hmm. really strong writer and a really strong storyteller. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the, the comics when it comes to that, but I mean, yeah, I mean, it seems like Bucky would be the logical heir apparent, if you want to say, to the S.H.I.E.L.D., um, but considering because of the Winter Soldier situation, it made sense that they would go to straight to oh, yeah. Sam. Yeah, so. Yeah. No, and, and that's another mm-hmm. thing where they, they skipped so much of of mm-hmm. that winter soldier development because the cinematic universe is such so more so much more compact Mm -hmm. you you know you couldn't have that because by the time bucky had picked up the shield in the comics you know we we had grown so much more we'd gotten past the winter soldier stuff um we had started doing flashbacks to Mm -hmm. and and some fans me included are kind of sad this wasn't included but uh to Natasha Bucky a uh, relationship back when they were both part of the Red Room. Really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, back with, you know, the what's going on in the Black Widow movie. Uh, yeah. that's supposed to be coming out really soon. Like in the comics, mm-hmm. Bucky was part of all that. Wow. And that was one of the things that actually got Natasha in trouble and kind of put her on in uh, the fringe of the red room stuff in her training Mm -hmm. is she fell in love with the winter soldier and it started bringing back Mm. up some of Bucky's memories and things like that. Oh, okay. Uh, Yeah. And and so, you know, that storyline, it's all pulled and yanked and not part of the MCU. So it, it, it makes sense that you won't include that in the, the MCU because it's, it doesn't exist so yeah it is what it is but um it'll be interesting i think the actor uh sebastian stain is popular enough that we may see a a bucky cap yet um yeah i'm still there there was rumors there was a yeah i mean there was a big fan push for him as luke also so that'd be curious (laughs) to see (laughs) Uh, now we want to switch over to Star Wars. Yeah, there was a big fan push there. <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, it's he he has options as an actor. So I think as a character, yeah. we never know where it's going to go because that's also a big part of the game. Once we get into right. movies over comics. Now, I mean, you just you mentioned it, uh, Star Wars. I mean, did you like? Okay, I am I am part of the I'm part of the minority that actually didn't like the Luke thing coming up in Mandalorian. Because I felt that it took away the storyline too much. And it was like, hey, it's Luke. And it's like, yeah, but there's this whole situation here with with Mando and and baby Yoda or whatever his name is. But you know what I mean? It's not baby Yoda, but, you know, <laughs> Grogu? Grogu? Grogu. Yeah, Grogu. Grogu. Yeah, yeah. Grogu. Yeah, yeah. And it's like yeah. their whole party gets like, by the time it's like, well, this is happening over here. But there's Luke. Luke's over there. <laughs> So it's, it's, I didn't like. I felt like it undercut it everything, and I or undercut everything. I just did not. I was like, and and plus the CGI was not up to par for me. I was like, mm. okay, I'll give. So the only thing I'm going to give you is the CGI right now. Yeah, it was okay. bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to be fair, we have to give credit where credit is due. Mark Hamill is the best secret safe in all of Hollywood. Plain oh and yeah. Simple. Nobody knew it was coming. Yeah. So credit where credit is due, you know, mm. Star Wars and Disney, all of them had a ton of fun with him just holding on to that secret. Mm. Yeah. Right. So that's that's one thing. We'll push that to the side because that's just fun. Uh, right. But 
when it ultimately comes down to it in that final scene where everything is going on, you have two options, right? You have Luke mm-hmm. Skywalker or some other Jedi. Yeah. Who would it have been? I mean, okay, here's the thing. I, I get why they did Luke, and I'm not saying that I'm not saying it was a bad thing to do, Luke, but I just I don't know. Like uh, I look back at it and my initial reaction was just so like, ugh. But then like when I look back, it's like I don't see any other way they would have done it. So like, no, you're not wrong. But at the same time, it just felt like it was such a big deal that everybody reacted so, so big, basically, oh God. <laughs> so, so massive to it that it just felt, it just felt like it cut, undercut that whole scene. I didn't even know what was going on with the scene yeah. because I was so focused on the CGI of being so terrible <laughs> that I'm like, oh, wait, I got to focus on this thing now because like this is a big like two season arc that's wrapping up <laughs> yeah. in front of my face. But like, but, but horrible CGI over here. It's just, it's just oh my God. It would just, yeah. Uh, and, and Yeah. Like I, I'll, not, I'll give you the CGI thing. Yeah. I think because... from what I heard, they did not have enough time to, to do it properly from what I understand. Like they were rushed into okay. doing it or they, they didn't have enough proper prep on that, which makes sense. Huh, interesting. Yeah. It so. would. But I, like if we're, let's be honest, Star Wars, while the original trilogy was amazing in actual mm-hmm. effects, like mm-hmm. there, there's no peer to what they did when they first came out. Yeah, they all are also terrible at their CGI. Let's look at Clone Wars, the original, you know. Um, and, and yeah. so, like for me, like expecting bad CGI is kind of at this point commonplace coming from Star yeah. Wars universe. Right. Like, and and this is like I love I love everything that is Star Wars, the books, yeah. the the shows, the the animated, mm-hmm. like everything. Um, but you know, I, I deal with the bad CGI, but I just, that scene and the show as a whole mm-hmm. is, is so well done. Like I can't be mad at the Luke. Like it's, you know, there's, there's probably yeah. someone out there more brilliant than, than us who would be like, Oh, well, if you had put like Coplune or you had put another Jedi or you had changed it with, you know, Ahsoka and moved on here, you could have yeah. worked with it. I'm like, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean, there was how there many was... people screamed and giggled when Luke walked onto that. Oh, I get walked it. Walked through those I doors. I get it. <laughs> I'm not saying they're wrong for being happy. I'm just saying the CGI was bad. <laughs> no, I agree. I, I agree. get it. But another thing that what people thought it was going to be uh, Ezra. Actually, that was a big rumor that it was going to be Ezra I because get that. it's a character you'd never seen before in live action. You know, a character uh-huh. that people part of the fan base is familiar with that would bring in that newer fan base to mandalorian yeah. um but it would well, they did I, that I, with I ahsoka have... true and they did it well with ahsoka too so i don't think it's a enough credit honestly uh especially after uh going from the playing you know night nurse in the marvel shows oh, and yeah. then coming over to star wars and hitting there um so far she's the only successful transfer from the netflix marvel verse yeah. over to disney um right right yeah it's but i think she was great but honestly i wouldn't be surprised if we see ezra in season three just because if we had ahsoka season two ezra would keep season three you would bring that coming in um especially with some of the retconning they've been doing with uh, Clone Wars and Bad Batch and stuff like that. I, I yeah. think season three, we're going to see a little more of that. And also as the popularity grows and with the promotion of Filoni and stuff like that, we'll see a little more mm-hmm. connection. And that'd be interesting to see what goes down there. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the, uh, that's the, you know, it's interesting that, the next season, I don't know what they're going to do because they got yeah. that Boba Fett show as well. Yeah, Book of Fett, yeah. yeah. And Which I'm, I'm a huge fan of. Both of those yeah. characters, let alone the actors who are playing them, yeah. are just, I mean, chef's kiss, you know? Yeah. Um, 
I'm, I'm a huge like I'm a big Star Wars fan, but the mm. the Mandalorians and the Fets and the Clone Troopers, like I was a huge fan of them before Clone Wars, the animated yeah. series like retconned a lot of stuff. So right. for me, seeing seeing the new Mandalorian stuff, seeing the Death Watch come back on, seeing Fett step back in, like I'm really giddy and really excited for. Um, I mean, I made my own Boba Fett helmet, let alone to, or I should say Mandalorian helmet, if we're going to be right. correct Tangible. about it. Yeah. Yeah. But, right. you know, like I'm a huge fan of them. So to see what they're going to do with Book of Fett and with the Bad Batch, let alone where we're going to go with the Mandalorian is very exciting mm -hmm. for me. One of the things that I, I think that we are also fans of is is Doctor Who. So, have you been keeping up with the show? Or uh, I, I, n the last episode I saw, because mm -hmm. I can't promise was the most recent, but it was right. um, the thirteenth Doctor. I did watch the first season of that. Okay, um, and yeah. I followed her and and that route and all mm -hmm. that. So I. HBO Max was doing a good job of keeping me up to date with that season. Yeah. So I don't know. I haven't seen anything new. So I'm going to assume there's not anything new currently. I There was season 12 and they're up to see, they're about to do season 13. So. Okay. Then I think I'm all caught up. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, the last show was the revolution of the Daleks, which was, um, which was with Jack Harkness came back. So I don't know if you just saw that. Just for a hair, like uh, oh, okay. like you saw the cameo, right? Yeah, the cameo, oh, okay. and then we walked into the Cyberman and and all oh, okay. that mess. Well, that was last season, yeah, where they retconned the whole thing. The cyber, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Cyberman kind of and the Master and yeah, and the Homeworld and all that. Yeah, that was the last stuff I saw. So spoilers, okay. maybe put a real quick warning I for mean, everybody like a year and a half so but yeah and then they did a, a new one for for new year's day was where jack Kem jack hartness comes back and okay, is actually so i haven't cool. seen that one yet yeah so but it's um yeah that whole retcon thing was kind of crazy like but I'm it's time travel i know and like i'm not against it because like you know because the knowledge that we had, the knowledge that the doctor had the whole time was that the first doctor was his first incarnation. Since, mm -hmm. since they didn't know anything about that, that makes sense because that's not retconning, that's just revealing new possibilities. Yeah. And they're basically now saying like, the doctor can regenerate forever. <laughs> so like, we can never have problems now because they went to like a 13... <laughs> 12 them. doctor thing where they had to get a whole because new set of generate regenerations well it was a it was okay exactly. because technically because the war doctor is part of the regeneration cycle and plus the the second tenth doctor is part of the regeneration cycle the eleventh doctor was technically 13 <laughs> so they had to do a regeneration cycle a new regeneration cycle to bring in 12 13 and and for another 13 incarnations so yeah and and, yeah. and so like we knew it was coming let's be honest like as a fan base they had to figure out a way to make it make sense yeah uh, <laughs> right right so like i'm not surprised and honestly i i don't mind like mm -hmm. my still my biggest upset is is not the doctor and the 13th and the retcon is I feel mm -hmm. Capaldi's run was cut short. I was I was just getting into the meat of Capaldi. Um, uh oh, uh, someone no. else agree with me or disagree with me? Oh no, Samantha <laughs> hates Capaldi. <laughs> uh, Capaldi had potential. I he know. Just, he I just know. was never written for. It's the same thing with Eccleston. Like, oh, we yeah. hit our stride with Eccleston, and then they're like, bye. Um, that was a whole other behind the scenes situation. Yeah, we could get you know, into about, his yeah. his interaction with uh, Moffat yeah. and all that stuff, and yeah. But yeah. like, if we just look at purely the writing aspect and the story of the Doctor, right? Mm -hmm. I, I feel both Tennant and Smith had the the best strides walking into the characters. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. They had the the best, like, let's be honest, they had the best story arcs. Yeah. Um, and we, Capaldi has a few monologues that are are spot on, that are just, that can yeah. hold up with anybody who's played the mm-hmm. Doctor. Um, same thing with Eccleston. Eccleston, though, has a little bit of an underlying rage that is yeah. just like, oh, that you can really get behind. And Tennant pulls it off. I think Tennant pulls the underlying rage really well. And mm-hmm. personally for me, Matt Smith, I only watched because I love the the Rory and Amy like yeah. whole story arc. That's just me yeah. though. Yeah. That's the thing. Like, I got in with I got in with Eccleston because uh, it was on H- it was on Netflix at the time, back in like 2011. Yeah. And I got in with Eccleston and then I I watched Eccleston's run and then I, st- I, d- I did a time and wimey thing. I started watching Matt Smith's episode and then like I started going to mm. that and then I came back and I finished with Eccleston through Tenet and then I got into Matt Smith. So like I, I did like a weird kind of like loopy thing, but um, mm-hmm. yeah. And then um, I really got into it at that point. And, at, but yeah, Tenet is probably, if not my, First favorite for my second favorite after I Matt Smith and Tennant for me are like they they constantly swap as favorite doctors. So for me, like that I can't really decide between the two. Although I really did like mm-hmm. the quality towards the end of his run. Uh, I thought that he really started coming into it. And I, I get what you're saying about being cut off because I felt like he was just hitting a stride uh whenever he left. Uh, because he started becoming more like the doctor like more kind yeah. and compassionate because he started off very rigid, but I kind of like that because he was coming after Smith and Smith was very childish and very youthful and him, like it was a cut, like a very sharp yeah. contrast. And well, they're, they're, they're throwing him in with the, the girl who never dies situation, right? The, his new companion in that one, in my yeah. opinion. Uh, there was so much story focused specifically on her. Yeah. Um, yeah. That I, I felt we we lost some of what Capaldi could have done mm-hmm. by driving a story that is companion centric. And I know there's a lot of companion centric stories. I'm not saying, well, yeah. you know, we, we had Amy and there was the whole story, Centurion and all that stuff. We have Mm. Rose and we have all that stuff. We have Dr. Donna. We have all that stuff. I get that. Yeah. Um, And and so there was a lot of those stories, but there was something about the, the Capaldi companion relationship that never, for me personally, felt quite on point. Mm. Um, We feel hurt him ultimately. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like they were, they were trying to wrap that up with, they, they started that whole thing with Smith at the end of his run. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's like exactly just wrap something up in the <laughs> and then apparently she stayed on for another season mm. more than she was mm. supposed to, and that also threw things into her wrench. And um, I think his best season is probably his last two. I think his last season was his best season, Capaldi was, because he got Billy coming in, and then you had a completely sea, a big sea change of like the mm. dynamics of him and the companion. And then also he became more like what he was supposed to be, which is a little bit more, you know, kind and everything. And he just became more of like the doctor to me at that point. I, I agree. Yeah. yeah. And honestly, I think one of the biggest flaws with the the newest doctors is I feel the companions are a little cluttered. I feel with the three mm-hmm. companions, we sometimes run into a lot of extra stuff. Yeah, and and I think while the cast is a strong cast, there, I call it the Spider Man three issue where you have too much going on. Yeah. Um, and I kind of feel that way right now. But yeah, I haven't seen the newest season apparent or the newest episode, so I'm a little behind. But that well, that season just felt away, cluttered. I won't give anything away, but two companions leave. But I'll just—I won't say who. But two of them. Okay. Leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are That's, sleeping with the TARDIS. Yeah. So. It's, so, and I, I think that kind of proves my point, though, that they a lot of people felt kind of the same way. It felt very yeah. cluttered. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, uh, it's very, um, yeah, it's very interesting. They bring on another companion, though, which I'm like, oh, Jesus. 
<laughs> I, th I think you're okay with two. It's a little rough, but yeah. if you do it right, it's okay. But I think three yeah. is very much a, a cluster. Um, except I guess I gotta, I have to bring up, uh, what is it? The class. Did you ever watch that? You know what? The, the spinoff. We did. we did. We did watch that. Uh, me and Samantha. And actually it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. It was I actually, liked it. I liked it much yeah. more than I liked Torchwood. Well, <laughs> Samantha laughed. I know that's controversial. Yeah, Samantha's probably hating me right now. <laughs> I liked it better than Torchwood. Um, yeah. And and it's a larger cl uh, group. It's a bigger ensemble, yeah. but it's I think it five, works well. Right? Five people? Uh, it's been a couple years since I've watched it's it, but five, I think so. Four or five, yeah. Two, four. I think, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think five's yeah. correct. I know that you have your D and D stuff. Uh, what websites do you use in order to um, do D and D or I, work? With I, I'll, I'll pitch a Twitter and uh, Instagram where the Tavern Arcane, uh, at the Tavern Arcane on both of those. Um, I, I can pitch my start playing games, uh, start playing dot games is the website, but I I'm fully booked there for running games. So I'm not picking up anything new, uh, okay. but I do run games, uh, one shots every Tuesday. So if people want to just kind of see what it's like and experience it, they can always check me out there. And it's under Ernesto at the Tavern Arcane there, uh, so those are the only things I just uh, don't have a lot of free schedules for brand new groups because I'm right, kind of maxed right. out right now. Okay. Uh, but yeah, you can check us out on Twitter, Instagram at the Tavern Arcane and just get D&D &D talk and uh, news and jokes and things like that. All right. Okay, great. Uh, we'll definitely, you know, check that out. I'm going to follow that on my thing as well. Appreciate on Instagram it. And Twitter. Uh, get the word out. Well, I, again, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy, busy schedule and your family life to, to uh, talk to me and share your love of D and D and all things geek. And uh, I'm glad you enjoyed that beer you picked up. So, oh yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, all right. Well, I just want to let you guys know that uh, you can follow us on uh, Geeks on Tap Show at um, on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You can also like and subscribe to this channel. Uh, you know, anytime, please. Yeah. So on, on, on YouTube and um, thank you again, uh, Neto for being on the show. Okay. My pleasure. All right. Well, until next time, this is Jeffrey geeks on tap. Your next beer is on us. Cheers. <laughs>